Tuesday, guys. My special guest tonight is Amali Yeshachela. He is the chairman of the African People's uh, Socialist Party, which leads the Uhuru uh, movement. Welcome back, Chairman Amali. Thank you very much for having me. It's good to be here again. So last time that uh, you were here, it was after the FBI had raided uh, one of the Uhuru movement homes in uh, Florida, if I remember correctly. Uh, and then sometime after that, apparently the Department of Justice decided to arrest uh, some of the members from the Uhuru uh, movement. And I do want to talk a little bit about that. Um, first and foremost, uh, I know that you were one of the members that that was arrested. How did those events actually you know, transpire? And then I also want to talk about the update in reference to that particular situation as well. Well, the first thing I want to tell you is that... Uh <clears throat> it was a coordinated uh, raid of uh, homes and offices uh, in two states uh, by the uh, federal government. Uh, they used uh, uh, armored vehicles and flashbang grenades and drones, and uh, they used battering rams and knocked down doors. In one place, they knocked down every door. Uh, in one of our centers, they uh, stole uh, recording devices. They stole uh uh, uh, laptops and cell phones and things like that, and 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 also uh, financial records. And this happened on July 29th, and uh, we came to understand, however, uh, that the this aggression against us in this period had begun earlier, on July 20, on July uh, uh, 2nd, <clears throat> right before the 4th of July celebrations and what have you. Uh, at the office in St. Petersburg, Florida, that was one of the places, the Uhuru house there, uh, that was attacked by the FBI on July 29th. Uh, someone pulled up into the parking lot uh, and opened up uh, his trunk in broad daylight and took out a military grade flamethrower and torched a, a 15 by 25 foot uh, red, black and green flag hanging from a 50 foot pole uh, out there uh, 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 next to the building. And so uh, we didn't recognize it then, uh, but it was a part of something that was developing and that it seemed to us that this attack on, on, on July 22nd <clears throat> was a strike. Uh, it was like a test run uh, that would happen. So uh, uh, then on July 29th, uh, as you mentioned, uh, our, our homes, uh, uh, were raided in offices, and my home was raided. Uh, my wife and I were threatened. Uh, I uh, it's pre-dawn when this occurs, and uh, and out of the darkness, this booming voice on a loudspeaker uh, commands uh, us to come out with our hands uh, up and our hands empty. That this is the FBI, and uh, so. At, and when this happens, these these explosions uh, began to go off. Uh, all around our house, and we were to later uh, learn that in the back stairwell of the house as well, they had uh, detonated these explosions. They call them flashbang grenades or concussion grenades, and uh, that 
tore up uh, plaster in the back of the house. And I asked my wife to, <clears throat> to allow me to go out first and that she should get on the phone and notify people that we were under attack. And uh, uh, so I went downstairs. She tried to do that on the phone, but our phones were jammed. And so she couldn't communicate with anybody. I get downstairs and uh, there's this military force standing there uh, in front of an armored vehicle. There are various numbers of these militarily attired men and women uh, standing there uh, with uh, assault weapons. And the assault weapons mounted uh, with laser targeting devices and all of them are hitting me in the chest. These are letting me know that, uh, uh, that they could kill me. Uh, uh, that, uh, that they have the ability to kill me if I uh, should move in a fashion that they uh, found undesirable. If I should stumble, uh, the point was that it was a death threat. There was no doubt about that. And I'm, I'm remembering, of course, as they knew I would, uh, the murder of Fred Hampton uh, by the FBI and Chicago Police Department in, in December of 1969. Uh, they came there at four o'clock in the morning. Here, it's, it's five o'clock in the morning. So when we get downstairs, uh, my wife, when she comes out the door, she is almost hit in the head uh, uh, by a drone that's going up the stairs as she comes out. Uh, this, they send the drone up. And so I get downstairs they, they, they zip tie me. Uh, they take my cell phone. They take, uh, uh, and my wife comes down and they, they handcuff her behind her back. And <clears throat> so I'm inquiring, what is this about? Why are you doing this? And they say, uh, that there's a Russian uh, national, uh, that an indictment is going to come down later that morning against a Russian national, and our name came up in the indictment, and uh, my name did. And uh, so that's why they were doing that, and they had a search warrant for my home. I asked to see the search warrant, uh, and they said, well, it, it's here someplace, but uh, uh, they, the person who was talking to me uh, didn't have it, he said. So... Uh, we 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 uh, engaged uh, 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 in this kind of uh, confrontation for a while, and they wanted me to sit on the curb, uh, you know, uh, 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 which was just a ridiculous, uh, ridiculous uh, uh, thing for them to. And it's humiliating. They, you see that all the time. They do young Africans like that. You see them sitting on the curb. It's yep. it's a form of humiliation and, and domination. Let you know. Uh, you know, that, that they have the power, uh, et cetera, and they let the community know. And because at the same time, they've cordoned off the entire community. So the community is blocked off and, and uh, uh, people are terrified because they don't know exactly what's happening uh, here. They did this uh, in St. Louis. They did the same thing in St. Petersburg, Florida. Uh, they knocked down doors. They went uh, in St. Louis. I live in a, in a predominantly African community here. In fact, it's one of the most economically depressed uh, sectors of the city of St. Louis at this moment. And so, uh, but across town, we have another office that's uh, uh, where the majority of white people live in South St. Louis. And uh, we have an office there, a solidarity center there that's uh, occupied and run by white people who do reparations work uh, uh, for, for the African movement. And uh, so they, this was one of the houses, that one of the offices, they knocked the doors down. Uh, they used flashbang grenades. They went upstairs where a couple lived, uh, one of whom Jesse Neville was to become one of the unindicted four uh, uh, members of our movement. They handcuffed him. They handcuffed the young woman uh, who is his wife. Uh, uh, also, uh, these are white people. And then they go uh, and, and attack the home of uh, Penny Hess, who was the chairwoman of the African People's Solidarity Committee, a white woman, and they, uh, and they handcuffed her, uh, uh, her uh, friend, who co uh, her roommate, uh, housemate, and they, uh, uh, you know, they occupied our building. They stole all kinds of equipment, materials, et cetera, and they occupied these buildings for up to eight hours, just taking stuff, and uh, we don't know everything they took. They took our radio off the air, in St. Petersburg, Florida, momentarily for a brief period of time, they went into our archives. They, uh, we have 40 years or more archived material from the African People's Social Party and the overall movement of Africans and other people around the world. Uh, they, they took things from those archives. They took our, fi they took financial records and what have you. All of this is this happened on July 29, 2022, and so uh, it would be. Uh, 
uh, it, we are unindicted co-conspirators. Uh, they say we are co-conspirators with the Russian uh, 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 person, the Russian uh, who who they uh, have indicted already, and they said that uh, that uh, it it put us in a very precarious kind of situation because we we don't have uh, standings in a courtroom because we haven't been indicted. So it's not like we can go to court and say, hey, what are you doing to us that we demand that this stop because we haven't been indicted. We have no standing. We're just there. And with this this threat any given time of the government uh, uh, attacking any time that they want to, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, and uh, of course, they they've got all of our materials. They're building whatever they want to construct in terms of whatever case they want to, uh, they want to put forward. Yeah. Well, the thing I, I want to point out to people, I want people to remember that <laughs> law enforcement did not handle Dylan Roof this way. And Dylan Roof had killed uh, black people in the church in, in Charleston, South Carolina. They arrested him calmly. They took him to get uh, food, if I remember correctly. Yeah, they took him, they yeah. brought him in. Right. And listen to the way that they treated Chairman Amalia Shetela, uh and the members of his movement. So this is very important all because they they basically claim that you have ties to Russia. And to that, even to that, I still push back and say, does that mean that you should receive that type of response, a militarized uh, response as if you had murdered someone? And I think that's the thing that's really alarming uh, to me. But they've been doing this for a long time, trying to take down African groups in this country in particular uh, that preach about socialism or trying to help out the community in some way, shape or form. Look at what they did to the Black Panthers. They had people actually infiltrate uh, the movement to take down Fred Hampton uh, because they see it as a threat. Um, but this has been in increasingly so. You would think that even in 2023 that things would have improved in reference to this, but things have actually gotten worse, uh, particularly since this conflict with Russia and Ukraine. Yeah, I think that uh, there's a crisis that this country is experiencing, and it's a normal, natural crisis, because if you have a system uh, that rests on the foundation of enslaved people, and you got to remember, uh, you know, Palestine is in, the, is in the news right now, rightfully so, because of the murder that's being committed against those people by settlers who are there. But you have to remember that the United States is a settler colony itself. Uh, that it's not like uh, the white people who are here are indigenous to this land. It's, a, it's it, you know, they're trying to do in Palestine uh, what they've attempted to do here in this country. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, you don't see indigenous people walking down the streets uh, in, in, in our communities, our neighborhoods, and you don't even hear them being talked about unless they're in the room and what have you. They live in concentration camps that people refer to as reservations. And you talk about uh, uh, Gaza, for example, being uh, an, an outdoor prison. Uh, what is a reservation? It's a concentration camp. And, and uh, North St. Louis is a concentration camp. It's an, open, uh, it's an open air prison, just like Gaza is. That's the colonial mode of production that this whole thing is constructed on that. So now you have this crisis because every time people strike out to try to win their freedom, their liberation, et cetera. It shakes the foundation, it shakes the entire social system. Now you've got a situation where uh, uh, entities that were supposed to be uh, non-significant, uh, uh, you know, uh, 1994, it was supposed to be over for Russia. Clinton, William Jefferson Clinton, you know, uh, did a victory dance and, you know, uh, they talked about this unipolar world that they dominated right now. And then China, of course, uh, people used to laugh at China in this country. You know, you don't have a Chinaman's chance, they used to say. And China has become an extraordinary power. And uh, it was a part of the whole struggle against colonialism that China was involved in. And, and now uh, it is contending for its own space. It's not uh, trying to attack the United States, nor is Russia, as far as I know. They're just contending for their own space. And the, and the U.S. and the colonial powers are determined to dominate all the space in the world, politically and economically, uh, to control the entire world. And uh, it, <clears throat> the illegitimate white nationalist state of Israel is a projection of that, uh, <clears throat> that attempt at, at world domination and specifically uh, targeting, uh, 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 well, it's not just uh, Palestine, 
Palestine is 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 extraordinarily uh, important because it's the vanguard of the whole struggle for the liberation of the Arab people. Uh, but it's the whole Middle East. It's the entire all of the oil and and uh, and and Northern Africa and what have. And Israel plays this this incredibly uh, role uh, in carrying and functioning to destabilize, destroy, undermine. I mean, it's in Syria. It's 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 you know it contributes to every contradiction that you see there and much of what you see in Africa. Another thing I, I want to bring up, so I want to pivot a little bit into uh, Israel and Palestine because there was an event recently. Uh, shout out to Medea Benjamin because she's she's a fighter. She's one. Um, it says breaking dozens of anti-war activists with code pink interrupt Secretary of State Anthony Blinken at a Senate hearing to demand an immediate ceasefire. Uh, in Gaza, and I just want to play this clip really quick. Not shrinking back. Not in the face of Russia's aggression against Ukraine. Not in the face of an intensifying strategic competition in the Indo-Pacific and around the world. If the witness will suspend, and I ask that everyone again respect this hearing, we will suspend until the room is clear. So shout out to Medea Benjamin. And you can see that there are people in the audience here uh, with their hands raised. And I believe that's supposed to be blood on your hands uh, in the audience. Shout out to Medea Benjamin and Code Pink for, you know, speaking out against this war as they have done uh, other wars as well. There's a point that Medea Benjamin brought up there that the American people do not want this. So I've been at a couple of protests uh, here in Boston. There's a huge one I hear coming up in D.C. as well. The American people, and it's not just the young people, because having been to this protest, there's people of all different ages, there's families, like people brought their whole families out to these protests. The American people do not want this conflict at all. And this is a time where I feel like when we compare it to Russia and Ukraine, for a while, I think a lot of Americans were on Joe Biden's side with we have to support Ukraine. Even that's starting to change, considering the amount of money that has gone to Ukraine. People started to speak out against that. But I don't think that Joe Biden expected this type of blowback with this particular situation with Israel and Palestine, even so much to the point that is actually affecting his polling numbers. He just dropped 11 points in the month of October alone among Democrat voters. This time, I really do feel like the American people are more vocal early on about a conflict than we were with like the war in Iraq. Uh, for example. And I want to get your your opinion about that. Why do you feel more people are are outspoken uh, and being against this this particular war early on compared to others? Well, <clears throat> I think what has happened is that <clears throat> the Palestinians uh, have forced uh, uh, themselves on the agenda. Uh, as far as the U.S. government was concerned and the illegitimate entity of Israel, uh, they had quieted the Palestinian movement. They were making deals with Saudi Arabia, with Egypt and others, and uh, they were appropriating resources to just uh, make uh, uh, the Palestinian question disappear. Somebody has said that, uh, in fact, we said it in, in the 1960s, uh, that uh, Israel uh, exists uh, 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 because Palestine was disappeared. I mean, it was pushed into non-existence. And so, uh, but the Palestinians came up and it shocked everybody. And uh, uh, the great uh, uh, Israeli defense capacity, its intelligence capacity, uh, its technology that was supposed to be able to see if anybody was coming, et cetera, that was shattered just, uh, and, 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 you know, people came fighting in every way they could fight. And, I, and it happened so suddenly uh, that it 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 took them by surprise, but like Vietnam, uh, people were able to see it. Uh, uh, after Vietnam, they learned from Vietnam, and then they took the reporters and embedded them. So the reporters that that happened subsequent to that, 
uh, themselves felt threatened. They were with the U.S. military, but now they are seeing it, and they are seeing you know bombs dropped on hospitals and babies killed, uh, uh, etc. And uh, I don't think that people want to be associated with that kind of murder. To be able to see it uh, automatically, uh, you know, uh, offers a suggestion of complicity. If you don't say something, if you don't stand out, because they're doing it in the name of the American people, and they're not doing it. Say this, they're not saying this is Blinken's killing. This is Biden's murder. This is America's murder, and everybody who identifies as an American has to be opposed to that. So I think that's part of what it is that we're seeing. The Palestinians have forced it. The Palestinians, people have been quiet. They've been killing Palestinians killing Palestinians and everybody's known it. You've been seeing it, but they've been quiet. And so this 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 uh, 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 counter offensive by the Palestinian people, this bold act by the Palestinians, I mean, came in from, 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 from land, coming in, whoever heard of somebody making a fight on hang gliders and things like that. I mean, they were ingenious in terms of, and they broke through uh, this, this extraordinarily in, uh, impenetrable uh, uh, defense uh, that they had established to lock the Palestinians into this 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 prison, and that's what uh, is true. When you talk about uh, Gaza, the population is smaller than Brooklyn, and 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 they use it as a bombing range. They're just murdering people in hospitals. They're murdering people, you know, in their community. They say here is a safe zone that you can leave. Get out of get out of Gaza. You got 24 hours to get a million people out of Gaza, they said. And then the routes that they established for people to leave, they murder people when they're trying to leave. This is what they're doing. And so uh, obviously uh, it's something that it's an obscenity, uh, uh, but that's how colonialism works. And that's really important for us to say. That's what George Floyd is. You don't just kill people. You put your knee in, your, in their necks and in this obscene, brutal kind of way that terrorizes the entire community. It's an example that they set. They dehumanize you, even in the violence, it's a form of dehumanizing us, the Palestinians, the African people, et cetera. That's how colonialism works. That's right. Another thing I want to mention too, um, shout out to Al Jazeera and other independent media, you know, journalists that are there on the ground because they have been able to get out the story of Gaza uh, via Twitter, um, some part of Facebook. Facebook started blocking some of this information, yes. but they've been able to get those videos out on Twitter. So we're all able to see what's actually happening. That's how I found out when they told people to move from the northern part of Gaza to the southern part of Gaza. That's how I found out that they were blocking the exits, that people yes. were showing up there and they were preventing them from, from getting out. Then there's also this issue in reference to colonialism this idea of the greater Israel, which uh, Richie Medhurst has been really good about this, explaining like what Netanyahu has talked about at these conferences, that the goal is not just to stop with Palestine. The goal is to go into the southern part of Lebanon, part of Syria, uh, part of Jordan. I think there's a, a small piece of Saudi Arabia as well. And the goal is to really push the Palestinians out into Egypt, even though Egypt said they can't take millions of people, but right. to push them out. But with colonialism, the goal is not just to take one small piece of land. The goal is to expand. That's Listen. how colonialism works. That's right. That's what, uh, that's what they call it in this country. Uh, uh, the, the, what was it? How did they characterize this movement uh, from the small uh, co colony of settlers and the uh, uh, you know, throughout the whole thing, the expansion, that's what it is. And uh, it's massive gentrification. It's, uh, you know, to, to push the whole people out and replace them with settlers. And, and this is something that must be understood about Israel. Israel is, is white. It's white. I mean, they have there are black people who are there. There are black people in the military who are there. Fifty percent of the, of the Africans who are in the military uh, 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 in, in the state of Israel have been in prison. I mean, you've got black people who are there. They sterilize African women who are there. They talk about Ethiopian Jews and what have you. And they're catching hell. It's a white state, and 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 uh, uh, I mean, even the concept. I mean, what's the difference ultimately in in the master race, uh, as it might have been characterized here in the United States or characterized in Nazi Germany, uh, and the chosen people as the basis for being able to take over people's lands and resources and properties? It's extraordinary as a political uh, 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 motivation for taking resources away from people. To, to be there as the chosen. And to also this, this thing about 
they're doing it because of the genocide and genocide was committed against Jews. They were murdered, they were killed and what have you, but they had a leadership that united with the system that killed them in Germany. They united with the system and transferred what that system was doing over into Palestine. And they're acting just like the murderers of Jews in Europe against the Palestinian people. That's an extraordinary thing. That's what the whole philosophy of Zionism uh, permits uh, them to be able to do that. So the Jews, uh, 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 you know, uh, caught hell in Germany, and, and obviously one has to has to be opposed to to murder to to that that happened to the Jews. But we have to be opposed to murder. Period. You cannot have genocide. Period. And and if in fact what happened to Jews in Germany is a basis for them looking for a homeland, uh, then it seems to me Germany or Frankfurt would have been the logical place for them to get that. Palestinians did nothing to them. Black people have done nothing to them. Arabs didn't do this to them. It was other Europeans, other white people who did this to them. And I would remind people in 1906, uh, Germany uh, did something similar uh, to African people in Southwest Africa. They went to Southwest Africa and the Herero people, the genocide, the murder that they committed there was a precursor to what happened later on uh, uh, to Jews uh, right there uh, in Europe and in Germany. But when the Jews were Germans, there was no massive protest against what was happening there. The point is that we have to be opposed to colonialism and colonialism is nasty. And it, what it does, it treats the colonized as the others. And, the, and it creates, a, a, it creates a, a philosophy that justifies murdering the others. And the, they got away with it in the 1960s. They were able uh, to have some element of success because they, they raised the issue of the Russian communists, the, the boogeyman, the Bolsheviks, communists, et cetera, et cetera. And so they were fighting against the communists and the communists' uh, fear. And people were taught when I was young, I saw, I saw, you, would, you, you, you wouldn't remember this, but you get under the, and as, even as children, elementary school, you get under the desk because the bomb might come any day. You hide from the atomic bomb that the Russians are going to drop. And then you had that. And then in the 1960s, you had this Russia phobia, this Russia, Russia, Russia. And then you had the black thing. And so you got black militants, black power. You got black thing and all of this to terrorize people and make them do cruel things and horrible things and justify wars that they're going to make against black people in this country and peoples in other places. But it can't work today. I'm telling you. And that's what... You know, the Code Pink, I'm glad you showed the Code Pink uh, video because, um, you know, uh, the New York Times a month or so ago did this whole thing that identified Code Pink in a way that almost uh, was like an indictment. You anticipate indictments coming against Code Pink uh, as well for the kind of work that they are doing. So I really, I'm really impressed by the fact that they went in and took that stance uh, uh, in solidarity with Palestine. And I think more and more people are going to be doing it. And uh, that's what part of what we'll be taking with us on November 4th in the Black People's March on the, on the White House. And I'm going to I want to get to that in, in just a second. But I, I want to get your opinion about this belief that some people feel that this is not our fight. So I've, I've been arguing with people on Twitter for quite some time that have told me that black people should not care about this issue with Israel and Palestine. I heavily disagree with that because, first of all, genocide should affect Everybody, everybody should push back against genocide. Everyone should push back against occupation of people. I feel like what's happening to the Palestinian people is very much connected to what has happened to black people, not just in this country, but also in Africa uh, as well. And one of the things that I, I point I've been pointing out to people is that I don't think a lot of people understand that black revolutionary leaders actually stood in solidarity with Palestine and the Palestinian people. If you were to go to Palestine and Ramallah, there is a, a statue of Nelson Mandela in Palestine. You know, Angela Davis, for all of her more liberal stance that she has today, she stood in solidarity with Palestine and still does, uh, according to a recent interview that I just saw as well. Malcolm X stood in solidarity with Palestine. Palestine. So I feel like a lot of times uh, black people, particularly in this country, we have been brainwashed by a whitewashed version of our history as a people in this country based on the textbooks that they have given you know, students in the classroom. So a lot of people just don't understand and don't know the truth about people like a Malcolm X, the truth about people like a Fred Hampton, unless a movie comes out about them. But I think people really need to understand that 
when we talk about the IDF in Israel, people need to know that the IDF trains police in the United States. So if you're out in the streets marching, you know, in, in solidarity for George Floyd or whoever else the victim of police brutality will be this month, you need to understand that those police officers, the NYPD has been trained by the IDF forces that are oppressing the people in Gaza and in the West Bank. So to me, I say, no, we should make this our issue. It should be important and we should not turn a blind eye to it. I want to get your take about that. It is our issue. And I think the IDF, uh, you need the Israeli defense force. You know, it is our issue. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, in 1964, Malcolm X was in Gaza. He was in Gaza. That's being destroyed right now. And uh, he was murdered shortly after. He was murdered in 1965, not too long after he returned from Gaza. And most of us who were in the movement at that time understood that one of the reasons they killed Malcolm was because he had moved to internationalize this struggle of black people here, taking it to deal with the Arabs and, and, and throughout Africa and what have you. So that's our struggle. And, and, and Malcolm was very clear on that. We saw in the 1960s, 1960, 67, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, came out uh, in solidarity with Palestine after the so-called 1967 six-day war, as it was characterized, and uh, came out on the side of Palestine. And all the white liberals and all the folk who supposedly loved black people at that time, they took their money back. And we were organizing in Mississippi where, where we were being killed, murdered in Mississippi, trying to organize black people against colonialism as it expressed itself there. They took their money back, left us stranded without transportation, that kind of thing, because we stood on the side of Palestine. And, and, and in uh, uh, 1970 or so, uh, we bought, uh, a, a, a full page ad in the New York Times of black people in solidarity with Palestine. We've always been a part of the same movement. You got Fanon, who people claim to love, you know, Franz Fanon, you know, who uh, promoted uh, the, the struggle against, uh, against Israel. You have uh, the Black Panther Party historically has done that. So that's been a part of that. And the reason it's, it's, it's not known is because they murdered most of the people we're talking about. Malcolm is dead. Fred Hampton is dead. Remember, the Black Panther Party destroyed by the same forces that we are talking about now. And, and then you have a repression that's so great, you can't even have a discussion about it because they say you're working for the Russians. They will come to your house at five o'clock in the morning and bomb your house and what have you. They say you're talking about for Russia. Why, why am I working for the Russians? Because I said that Black people should take the United, the United States before the UN uh, for violation of the convention, the 1948 Convention on the Prevention uh, and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, as it applies to Black people, because uh, we organized and got 130, more than 130,000 signatures, and it was uh, on uh, this. Uh, what do you call it? This entity on 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 internet that uh, 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 anyway it was it was taken down. They took that down uh, uh, as a part of the attack that they made against us. Uh, uh, you're talking about, uh, what did I do? Uh, we, we ran candidates uh, for office in 2017 and 2019 demanding reparations for black people. They said the Russians paid us to do that. Uh, even though we've been doing this for 50 years, that's what we've been doing for 50. And black people have been, black people were the first out of the gate. In 1948, when the United Nations passed that convention, 1952, black people were at the United Nations with the huge document chart characterizes we charge genocide against what was happening to us. They say, I work for Russians because I, I oppose uh, uh, this, this war that the United States is making against Russia using Ukrainian bodies and, 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 and entities as the vehicle to do that. So Russians and Ukrainians are being killed in this. They said the Russians paid me to do that. So they said, I use what they characterize as free speech, uh, but it ain't free. And they demonize the we make, become the others, the Russians, the boogeyman, the black people, the boogeyman. And they also infer here something very insidious that it must be Russians because black people don't have uh, the agency of our own. We don't have enough sense. We don't have enough agency to say this is our issue. This is our stance, et cetera. And that's what they will do even with the Palestinian question. They will say that it's not. And, you know, they would say it's not our, our, our issue, our case, et cetera, et cetera. But somebody must be uh, influencing us to do something that's against our, 
our interests, but that's not the case at all. We have interests as, as people. Uh, we have agency as people and most of the people around the world. I mean, even as we have in this discussion, the thing that's disturbing to me is that there are forces who, in the name of supporting Palestine, would, would, would actually work to isolate the Palestinians from the overall struggle against colonialism. Because if we have in this discussion, there is a discussion being promoted in, in bourgeois and the colonial media that now that since the black people of, in, in, in places like Niger and Mali pushing France out, now black people are just being killed, you know, uh, by other black people who are the terrorists, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems to me they're setting up a situation where black people should be, where the U.S. and other forces can go into and back into Mali, back and to rescue France uh, or to rescue colonialism. Look at, they want to use how Kenya, they want to use Kenya to go into Haiti uh, to attack uh, African people there. They're talking about CARICOM, all of this. This is colonialism. In Venezuela, what they do with Venezuela, Cuba, that's colonialism. And, and all of that's a part of what's happening to Palestine now. And the Palestinian issue has to be taken on uh, within the context of recognize it's a part of colonialism, a colonial uh, a, a mode of production, just as what's happening to black people is colonialism and colonial mode of production. We end this thing together. And I want Palestinians uh, locked uh, arms with me in this struggle. And I want people from Venezuela to lock arms with me in this struggle. And I'm going to lock arms with the Palestinians, the Venezuelans, and everybody else who's fighting against this social system. That's right. Uh, well, there are some um, people that are uh, speaking out in agreement. Uh, Black for Palestine said 2,000 plus Black voices demand a ceasefire. Now we are making the statement as Black people in solidarity with Palestinian people committed to our shared liberation. The genocide in Gaza is an emergency and we must act uh, now. Um, and this also mentions uh, Angela Davis, Cornel West, uh, Kalani, Mark Lamont Hill, uh, No Name, Saul Williams, uh, Warsan Shire, and more. Um, so that was blackforpalestine.com. And then I want to bring up this event that's coming up soon, uh, November 4th. So uh, for those of you watching, if you're in the D.C. area, November 4th is going to be lit. Because there is the the palace the, the there's the Palestine March that's happening November fourth, and there's also the fifteenth annual Black People's March on the White House. Can we talk a little bit about this, uh, Chairman? The fifteenth annual Black People's March on the White House is also a Palestine March. We've always held Palestine high. It's always been a part of our our uh, national Black political agenda for self determination. And although there has been some uh, effort to try to split the two, but uh, it is Palestine. We march, we march against colonialism. And we also have created, uh, uh, as in July uh, 8th, uh, uh, we created this, this um, uh, anti-colonial uh, free speech mobilization so that we, we're doing it in Washington, DC. Uh, they're gonna be um, Mexicans and Puerto Ricans and Filipinos and, and various other people. We're doing it uh, in Los Angeles, California. Uh, it's also going to be happening. Uh, we're also uh, having uh, a protest at the U.S. Embassy in London. We're also having protests at the U.S. Embassy in Pretoria, South Africa. Uh, there's going to be action also uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, Lungi, uh, in Sierra Leone, and also in Liberia. So all of that's going to be happening November 4th. Black people are on the move now, and we're in solidarity with the Palestinian people, et cetera. Uh, like I said, it's an anti-colonial mobilization. We're not going to allow them to isolate the Palestinian question or to isolate the struggle for black people. Yeah, and I want to point out some of the speakers. Of course, people that you guys know, uh, Garland Nixon is going to be one of the speakers. I feel like Garland speaks at a lot of things. Um, Ajamu is going to be one of the speakers as well. Betty Davis. Um, I'm just scrolling through some of them here, some of the ones that I know, like offhand. Um, uh, Nefta Freeman is going to be one of the speakers. So definitely, like I said, if you guys are in the D.C. area, November 4th is going to be lit. You can't sit back and tell me there's nothing for you to join and get involved in. There are several things uh, happening. That is the International Solidarity uh, for Palestine Day, by the way, guys. So there's going to be things happening all over all over the world. So definitely check that out. Uh, if you're in the, the DC area, I think that's, that's really good news. And I just, I love seeing this. I love seeing this. You know, I have to tell you, um, chairman, after the George Floyd protests, I feel like the energy, the, 
I don't know, organizing mm -hmm. energy and protest energy was starting to fade away uh, because there were other police brutality incidents that happened after that. And I feel like people did not get into the streets in large numbers in reference to those particular cases. Uh, but then I, I saw like movements start to emerge again in reference to, you know, anti-war movement in reference to Russia and Ukraine. But even when we compare the anti-war movement with Russia and Ukraine, it does not compare to the thousands of people that I've seen out in the street in reference to Israel and Palestine. And I have to say it is great to see people mobilizing again. I think so. And I think it's great to expose that uh, that settler state um, and because uh there is no way that colonialism, you can you cannot reconcile the, the interests of the colonized and the colonizer. They are, they are uh, opposite. There's, there's no reconciliation there. And uh, Israel exists at the expense of Palestine. And so the Palestinian, we say long live Palestine, free, free Palestine. And we say that the unity of Africans and Palestinians is live and that it is absolutely necessary to, to have victory over this whole colonial mode of production. That's right. And uh, really quick before you go, uh, any update on that, the DOJ uh, case? I know that you guys were released, but I think a lot of people are asking, like, is it all settled or are there other things that you have to deal with? It's not settled and we are not released. I'm on. Uh, uh, I have to get permission to go to Washington, D.C. I have uh, I'm under a twenty five thousand uh, dollar signature bond. And my passport has been taken away from me. I have to uh, report uh, to somebody like a parole officer once a week. I have to get permission to travel from one place to the other place. Uh, and so it's not over. And uh, right now we're scheduled for trial uh, in February. And so uh, uh, that's Black History Month, by the way. And uh, so uh, the thing is that uh, much of this on November 4th that we are dealing with also is to push back against that. You know, we're not going back uh, to the back of the bus on some kind of pre-revolutionary uh, period where black people have to bow and scrape and what have you to get along. And so uh, that's that's effectively what we're saying. We're saying that uh, not one step backwards, uh, that the FBI attack on the black, attacks the black liberation movement again. We say drop the charges now. That's the, one of the demands that we're making and free, free Palestine, long live Palestine. And so we have this, this combination uh, of, of contradictions that we are dealing with and calling everybody. And it, it doesn't matter if you plan to be in the DC area uh, prior to now, plan to be in the DC area, uh, knowing that these events are going to, going to be happening. And come in solidarity with the Black Liberation Movement and and, and we're saying that the Black Liberation Movement has always stood with Palestine and will continue to stand with Palestine because we end this thing together. There are some people who may be marching and talking and what have you. They do this uh, as um, a, a part of uh, their protests, you know, practice and tradition. But Black people and Palestinians, it's not just a matter of protest. The fact is life and death for us. Colonialism must go. We must defeat colonialism come to uh, Washington, D.C. for November 4th, join the Black People's March uh, on the White House and join in solidarity uh, with uh, Palestine and force the U.S. government to drop the charges now uh, and defend the African Liberation Movement as well. Awesome. Well, Chairman, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you very much for having us. All righty. Bye. Uhuru. All right, guys, that was Chairman Amali Yeshitela. Awesome, awesome. Guys, again, I just want to remind you, you know, people are still being either heavily censored or they're being targeted by the DOJ, by the FBI, again, for going against the status quo. If they were willing to smear uh, the Hoover movement, if they'll smear Amali Yeshitela, they'll smear you too. So this is why, and I'm trying to tell people when we talk about the censorship, this is why I continue to mention, you have to talk about the fact that Facebook is trying to censor people who are against the status quo. Uh, Twitter has been, they're, they're doing some censorship, but not as much as Facebook and Instagram. Uh, this is why they've been deplatforming people on YouTube and things like that. Like they really don't want this type of message to get out. They want you to be a part of the status quo. So we really do have to support people like Amalia Shatella and the people that are out there in the streets fighting. Amalia Shatella has been doing this longer than I've been alive. So that's just something to, to keep in mind. Someone asked me, can white people come? Yes, Turbo, white people can come. 
again, like it's not just black people that are in this fight. There are white people that are in the Uhuru uh, fight as well. So again, November 4th, if you're in the DC area, don't, don't come to me and say, there's nothing for me to do. Don't, don't tell me. Cause listen, I'm in Boston. So we don't have as many protests as DC does. DC has protests all the time. I feel like, but if you were in the DC area, November 4th, there are multiple things for you to get involved with. Again, that is Palestine International Solidarity Day. So there's going to be things happening across the globe. If you can go, don't miss it. All right. We have more to discuss tonight, you guys. More to discuss. Really quick, I do want to go ahead and give a shout out to our patrons. Thank you guys so much for your support. I really do appreciate it. If you are interested in being a savvy patron, I have five categories ultimate, sabinators, sabsters. There are also sabbies and of course members. All of their names are featured here and you can also see their names scrolling across the bottom of the screen there on the ticker. And I want to give a shout out to a new savvy patron over here. We call them newbies. Let's give it up for RFK Peace Nick 19. 19. I said 19. RFK Peace Nick 19. Welcome and thank you so much. And happy Halloween, guys. Didn't think I forget, did you? Didn't think I forget. Usually, like sometimes I'll dress up for like Halloween, like on YouTube, but I was interviewing the chairman tonight, so I did not want to come on here with a costume. <laughs> I don't want to scare anybody. Uh, but yeah. But happy Halloween. I hope you're having a good holiday. I don't know if you guys participate in like trick-or-treating. Like do kids still trick-or-treat? I don't have trick-or-treaters come by. So I'm, I'm seriously answering that question. Do kids still go trick-or-treating? I don't know. I don't know. You guys will probably know. All right. So what else are we going to talk about tonight, guys? Let's go ahead and share that thumbnail and we'll get into the other news stories. There's a lot happening right now, folks. Wait till Thursday. I have a huge show Thursday because it's, it's, I couldn't fit everything in tonight, obviously. All right, tonight we are discussing Noam Chomsky alerts. What is this about? Is Noam Chomsky, has he been right all along about a particular issue? We're going to get into that. We're also going to discuss Rashida Tlaib uh, pressures Joe Biden. So this is actually pretty huge. I was surprised to see this coming from Rashida Tlaib, but we're going to get into that and we'll talk about whether or not this will be effective. We're also going to discuss John Fetterman is confronted and we're going to talk about this divide that is happening among the left in reference to this position with Israel and Palestine. And some of these things we kind of predicted before, but we're going to talk about these new events that have happened. And of course, Amali Yeshitela was just here. Let me go to the comments and then we'll get into the first story. Thank you for the super chat, Chima, Chima, Chima Madu. How do you feel about all of these black Hebrew Israelite clowns fighting with Palestinians and pro-Palestinian protesters on the streets of Chicago? So I have not seen that. I'd have to look at that. I don't want to go into calling them clowns. Uh, but what I would say is I want everybody to realize that all of us should be against uh, genocide. Shout out to Rick says Uhuru. Shout out to Sean says Uhuru. What's going on? Bebel says, Sabi, I don't understand. Is the Uhuru rally together with the other solidarity rally or separate? So what I understand is this is a separate event, but I have this, this feeling from what I've seen. It seems like all these people are going to end up together at some point or another. Um, DC is only so big in reference to like protests and things like that. So either way, like I'm saying, you have a way to get involved. Uh, see cow. Yes. We went trick or treating or treating today. Oh, so are people doing this earlier now? Is that the thing? Do kids go trick or treating earlier than Aziz said, I did Halloween dressed as myself. All right. Aziz. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> oh man. Okay. So let's go ahead and get into our first story here, which is about John Fetterman. You know, I hate to be the one to say, I told you so. But when John Fetterman was actually running for Senate, I tried to warn people about some of his positions. 
Now we're starting to see some of this come into light. So I want you to see this clip here from Dan. Uh, Dan is actually one of John Fetterman's constituents. He actually voted for John Fetterman and he decided to approach him in reference to his opinions and his actions about Israel and Palestine. So Dan goes on to say, I just took on John Fetterman for his failure to support a ceasefire for Gaza and was assaulted. Let's let's get into this, guys. Here we go. So I just want to pause here for a second. He's saying, why aren't you supporting a humanitarian ceasefire? Oh, I can talk. To, I voted for him. I'm sorry. This is a democracy. It absolutely is. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. Is. But kind of, sort of. Why? So I'm pausing in between because there is there's some kind of music in the background. But um, again, Dan is letting you know that he voted for him. People in Gaza have been killed. Half of children. The Pope's calling for a ceasefire. The UN is called for it. I'm just asking you. You're a good guy. I voted for you. I know you're a nice guy. This is important. Here, can I give you? OK, let's go ahead and pause it here. So one of the things that he's mentioning is like, why aren't you calling for a ceasefire? Which obviously is a legitimate question. And John Fetterman is not. Notice John Fetterman is not speaking. Notice he hasn't said anything. Now, I don't know who this gentleman is. I don't know if that's John Fetterman's bodyguard or whatever. But this guy just kind of jumps in to push Dan out the way, which I felt like this interaction here and this position from uh, whoever this guy is. I don't know who this guy is. John Fetterman's a bodyguard, we're going to call him. I feel like this position is a bit extreme continu continuing the fact that Dan did not uh, was not hostile towards John Fetterman, asked him a question directly to his face, told him that he voted for him, he supported him, and yet here comes Fetterman's bodyguard to jump in, and this is the way that he responds. And this is what I've been saying before about holding your politicians accountable. The people around them, they don't even want you to ask them tough questions. So this is what happened today. Is this necessary? Is this necessary? So because he asked John Fetterman a question, apparently they have to push him completely out of the bar. Completely out. He just assaulted him. He just assaulted him. He just assaulted him. He just assaulted him. He was just talking to him. He assaulted him. Now, what I do want to show you here is this part right here. Here's the witness, this duck. You see this duck? Here's the witness right here, here's the duck. The duck saw the whole thing. Now obviously, that response was extreme, obviously. But this is how they respond. And my question is this, no, John Fetterman did not put his hands on Dan. But my question is, why didn't John Fetterman stop his bodyguard from pushing him out the way that he did. This is how they treat their constituents. Then next time for re-election, they come back around and tell you, vote for me again. They don't care about their constituents. They don't care about you. But why does John Fetterman have the position that he has in reference to Israel and Palestine? I mean, this particular video went viral on Twitter and made it all the way to Newsweek, guys. All the way to Newsweek. So it says John Fetterman confronted by pro-Palestinian protester in viral video. Let's get into this here. Pennsylvania Senator John Fetterman apparently walked away from a member of the public who was questioning him about his failure to support a ceasefire in the Gaza Strip as Israel has reportedly started to roll out its ground invasion of the territory. Let's go down here. Fetterman's stance sparked statewide pro-Palestinian protests outside his four offices, with hundreds of demonstrators gathering at the Customs House in Philadelphia on Thursday. 
It goes on to say, among the many who have called on Fetterman to reconsider his position and demand an immediate ceasefire in Gaza was Daniel Kovalik, a 55-year-old former professor of international human rights who shared a video on X, formerly known as Twitter, in which he confronts the senator about his stance on the Israel-Hamas uh, war. Dan who taught at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law until his contract expired in June, asked the Democrat why he doesn't support a humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. And then we'll skip over this part because this was already said in the video. But Fetterman did actually issue a statement right about here. In a statement published by his office, Fetterman said he won't support a ceasefire in Gaza until after Hamas is neutralized. But let me tell you what that really means. That means that more Palestinian civilians are going to die as a result. Goes on to say innocent Israelis were the victims of a terrorist attack that resulted in the largest loss of Jewish lives since the Holocaust. Now we know that the tragedy at the Gaza hospital was not caused by Israel. I grieve for every innocent person and brave Israeli soldier killed since Hamas started this war. If not for the horrific attacks by Hamas terrorists, thousands of innocent Israelis and Palestinians would still be alive today. Would they? Would they though? For the past two years, haven't we been showing you haven't we been showing you how they've been killing Palestinian people, people who were peaceful protesters in Palestine, how they were shooting at their feet, how they've been dragging kids through the street? This isn't new. This isn't new. Let's continue. He added, now is not the time to talk about a ceasefire. We must support Israel in their efforts to eliminate the Hamas terrorists who slaughtered innocent men, women, and children. Hamas does not want peace. They want to destroy Israel. We can talk about a ceasefire after Hamas is neutralized. So that was his response. Now, in reference to what he's saying here, that Hamas wants to destroy Israel, can't we say also that Netanyahu wants to destroy Gaza? According to leaked documents that I'm going to show you later on tonight, that is the case, that they don't want the Palestinian people there. That has been the plan from all along. But John Fetterman isn't going to say that. And I want to get to this part right here as well. Fetterman's opposition to a ceasefire has been criticized by some of his own former staff members with a group of 16 ex-campaign staffers signing an open letter to the senator asking him to change his stance as first reported by the Intercept news outlet. Now, I don't know what those staffers were thinking and I don't know where those staffers have been because from the very get-go, when John Fetterman was running for Senate, he was very clear about where he would stand in reference to Israel and Palestine. So I'm going to take you back. I'm going to take you back to this article from Jewish Insider. Just a reminder, folks, just a little reminder. This article was written April 11th, 2022. John Fetterman says he'll lean in on U.S.-Israel relationship as senator. Let's get into it. I'll make this a little bit larger. John Fetterman, the Lieutenant Governor of Pennsylvania and the Democratic front runner in next month, high profile Senate primary said he was eager to affirm his unwavering commitment to bolstering ties between the U S and Israel in an interview with Jewish insider on Thursday, emphasizing that he will lean in on such efforts. If he is elected to the upper chamber this November. So there you have it. He told you what he would do way ahead of time, way ahead of time. Now, I also want to say this because I remember something else. 
Back during this time, those of us at RBN, we told you about John Fetterman. We warned you about John Fetterman. We told you he was not progressive. While other commentators sat here trying to convince their audience that he was progressive and that he supported progressive policies, when there was actual video footage of him telling you that he was not progressive. We'll get to that in just a second. I don't know how many times I showed this article on my channel during that time. Granted, I didn't have as many viewers then as I do now, but I don't know how many times I had to show this. And it wasn't until it seems like all of a sudden people don't realize this until after he was elected. After he was elected, he was very clear about where he would stand in reference to this position. He went on to say, whenever I'm in a situation to be called on to take up the cause of strengthening and enhancing the state, the security of Israel or deepening our relationship between the United States and Israel, I'm going to lean in. Let me highlight this again, because this is the tell all folks. Whenever I'm in a situation to be called on to take up the cause of strengthening and enhancing the security of Israel or deepening our relationship between the United States and Israel, I'm going to lean in. So I don't know why people are surprised now. And those 16 staffers or former staffers of his, why are they surprised? Why are they surprised now all of a sudden? He told you who he was. This is what happens when people don't pay attention. And he went on to say here, the relationship is a special one that needs to be safeguarded, protected, supported, and nurtured through legislation and all available diplomatic efforts in the reason. So, we all know why politicians are doing this. We all know why. We all know why. Now, I tried to warn you, and I'm going to show you that I tried to warn you. This was over a year ago, this stream. One year ago, I said Fetterman was not progressive. Listen to this part. And I didn't know about this. So I'm going to let you hear this for yourself. Here we go. Are you a progressive? No, I'm just a Democrat that has always run on what I believe and know to be true. And six years ago, that was considered progressive. But now there isn't a single Democrat in this race or any race that I'm aware of that's running on anything different. So that's not really you know, progressive. That's just where the party is. And I think that's the essence of what our party stands for, right? What? Thanks for no. One more time. Are you a progressive? No, I'm just a Democrat that has always run on what I believe and know to be true. And six years ago that. That's all you need to hear. You heard the whole thing already. And by the way, there's multiple videos on YouTube of him in interviews saying he's not a progressive. So I tried to warn people back then. And it was funny to me. You can tell people didn't do any research. Didn't look up any information. People were just like, oh gosh, this is the progressive in the race. Really? He kept telling you he wasn't. He kept telling you that he wasn't. So what you are seeing from John Fetterman today, that is what John Fetterman showed you when he was running for Senate. John Fetterman has not changed his position in reference to Israel and Palestine John Fetterman did not change his position in reference to whether or not he felt he was progressive or not. John Fetterman told you exactly who he was when he was running for Senate, but people didn't want to see it. Going to get to some of the comments here in the chat. Thank you for this, Gene. Gene says, Denver, Colorado, Sunday, November 5th at 12 p.m. at 200 E. Colfax Avenue. So there's another one. Another one. Gamer says Fetterman is terrible and is owned. Yes. Yes. Again, follow the money. All you have to do is look up their donor information and you'll see why people have the positions that they have. I'll take that comment on Rockfin, Eric. Thank you. Thank you for the tip on Rockfin, JVB. Thanks for bringing Mr. Yeshitella on. You are welcome, JVB. You are welcome. We're moving into this story about Rashida Tlaib and Joe Biden. 
So apparently, obviously, Rashida Tlaib has been very vocal about the plight and the struggle of the Palestinian people. Obviously, Rashida Tlaib is also Palestinian. And sometimes she stood alone with that position in Congress. I pushed back on Rashida Tlaib over a week ago when I said, well, if you feel as strongly as you do about this issue, then maybe you should vow not to endorse Joe Biden and you should be calling for people to not vote for Joe Biden since he is supporting this conflict. Well, apparently that is now happening. And I couldn't believe it. Believe it or not, I'll give credit where credit is due. Rashida Tlaib is now pushing this type of campaign to actually tell people to withhold their vote for Joe Biden. I want to go ahead and bring this up. It was Means TV that announced this. There is no excuse for Joe Biden's support of Israel's genocidal campaign in Palestine. Don't count on our vote in 2024 made with Rashida Tlaib. You got to see this, folks. I couldn't believe it. We stand with Israel. Mr. President, the American people are not with you on this one. Innocent civilians are going to be hurt going forward. I wish I could tell you something different. I wish that that wasn't going to happen, uh, but it is, it is going to happen. I want to thank President Biden for his unequivocal support. Remember in 2024. So, you know that she is going to be heavily attacked for that. The rest of her squad members don't seem to be on the same page in reference to withholding a vote uh, for Joe Biden. Um, so I think that is a brave thing for Rashida Tlaib to do. Now, again, you do have to ask yourself, why would she feel more comfortable doing that other than the fact that, yes, you know, she is Palestinian. You also have to understand her district. And I've said this before, that the squad tends to move the way that their district wants them to move on certain issues. This is why AOC is very outspoken when it comes to immigrant rights for Latino Americans, right? Because again, that's her district. Uh, when it comes to some of these things that African Americans are fighting for in this country, AOC is not uh, uh, as willing to support. Like she does not support reparations for African Americans that are descendants of slavery in this country. She's vocally said that in interviews. She does not support defunding the police, like things that fit like our community, so to speak, she's not going to support because that's not her district. So you'll see them tend to do this thing. So with Rashida Tlaib, and thank you so much for saying this because I was going in this direction, Shirley. Her area has um, a high Arab population and she already knew they were a no on Biden. So this is important for people to hear. So again, when your constituents are backing you on a particular issue, it is going to be easier for you to come forward and put pressure on the status quo and against establishment Democrats. That being said, though, she is Palestinian and it would look some kind of way if she didn't speak up about this. Even Justin uh, Amash, I don't know if everyone remembers him. You remember Justin Amash? Justin Amash uh, he used to be Republican during the Trump administration. He decided to leave the Republican Party and become an independent. So Justin Amash is also has been very vocal about this on Twitter, saying that he's already lost Palestinian family members overseas as well. 
So that's something I want people to keep in mind. So what are people asking for? What are some of the things that Rashid is asking for? Obviously she's asking for a ceasefire. That's a no brainer. But the other thing too, is for the people in Palestine to have self-determination for those people to be free. Now I want to pause here for just a second about the free part. Because people keep asking, what does that mean? What does it look like to have a free Palestine? For the people who are not aware, I've shown this guy from TikTok before. I think he explains things very well. He's also kind of funny too. But actor Michael Rappaport, you guys may remember him from like back in the day. I don't know if he really does stuff anymore. He was one of those people that criticized that. I was like, what do you mean about a free Palestine? Like, if you have to ask that question, then that tells me you don't know the history. That tells me you don't really understand what the Palestinian people are going through. That tells me that you don't understand that there was a Palestine, which a lot of people still don't want to acknowledge, that there was colonialism that did happen there, that the Palestinian people have been pushed out, and that they have had their homes seized and taken away from them. So this gentleman from TikTok who I think is pretty cool. He explains these so well, so well. And it honestly will just make you feel like a dummy if you're not paying attention. Listen to this. A lot of people are saying free Palestine. I would like people to explain what that means and what that looks like. I'll tell you exactly what that looks like. It looks like Palestine being given their primary right to self-determine as a people in accordance with international law and the world consensus. It looks like Palestine not being encircled, besieged, blockaded, and invaded by Israel. It looks like Palestine not being kept on what human rights organizations and international judicial bodies all resoundingly and unanimously decry as a diet of starvation where they are deprived of basic human necessities they need for survival, including food, medical supplies, and building materials that they need to rebuild their cities after that murderous regime comes in and invades their land so they can mow the lawn with disproportionate violence, which they've been doing for decades. It looks like Palestine not being the victim of an endless barrage of war crimes, collective punishment, and crimes against humanity. So there's your answer to that, folks, <laughs> for people who keep asking that question. Yes, that's what it would look like. But there is a split in reference to squad members and the left in particular uh, around this particular issue. And another thing we talked about recently is that this is actually affecting Joe Biden's numbers for the people who told me this was not a big issue and that this did not really matter. Apparently that is not the case, especially since more Americans become more knowledgeable about what has happened to the Palestinian people. And I want to bring up this from the intercept in reference to the numbers. Biden's we're going to leave out the conspiracy part. Biden's theory about Gaza casualty numbers unravels upon inspection. So one of the things Joe Biden did is he tried to lie about the number of deaths that the Palestinian people have experienced. President Joe Biden asked last week what his government planned to do to reduce the number of civilian casualties in Gaza, responded by rejecting the idea that the numbers could be trusted. I have no notion if Palestinians are telling the truth about how many people are killed. Biden said on Wednesday, I'm sure innocents have been killed and it is the price of waging war, but I have no confidence in the number that Palestinians are using. That response right there from Joe Biden did not help him out in reference to his poll numbers, because what Joe Biden was showing you is that he was willing to question the casualties in reference to the Palestinian people, but he is not willing to question anything in reference to the numbers, the data, and the information that is being reported by the state of Israel. People see the difference. So this did not help Joe Biden. A new analysis by The Intercept provides evidence refuting that claim. Biden's efforts to 
to delegitimize the numbers coming out of Gaza as fake news has created an opening for defenders of Israel indiscriminate bombing campaign to dismiss the crisis. They know that Hamas governs Gaza and therefore runs the Ministry of Health and is inflating the figures. Biden later clarified he meant to say he didn't trust Hamas. Not all Palestinians, according to the Wall Street Journal. But the problem that we've been seeing time and time again is that not just Joe Biden, but our politicians in D.C. and mainstream media in general, for the longest time, they have been referring to the Palestinian people as Hamas, as though it's one thing. And had it not been for the international protests and the numbers of people that came out into the streets, I don't think they would have even talked about the history and the occupation and what the Palestinian people have been dealing with for over 75 years because they were not doing that in the beginning. It goes on to say that Biden's claim was quickly rejected by human rights organizations that have been active in Gaza for years. The Associated Press noticed that the Ministry of Health's figures from previous conflicts have broadly matched the numbers arrived at by both the Israeli government and the United Nations. And the State Department itself has long considered the numbers reliable. So this is one of the things that is hurting uh, Joe Biden. So for Rashida Lieb to say, withhold your vote unless you call for a ceasefire. And then he already has the poll numbers against him now because of that decline, because of the way that he has responded to this conflict. It does not look good for Joe Biden if the election were today. Now, to another point about this divide in reference to what's happening with the squad and people of the left altogether, this is a moment where I really do feel that if the left is really going to use leverage once again, this is another moment where that could be done. It was not done during forced to vote. It can be done now. So we have another opportunity of this. So if Rashida Tlaib is saying withhold your vote for Joe Biden, imagine if more people join along with that. Now I told you guys don't vote for him, period. I told you guys don't vote for Donald Trump, Joe Biden, none of them, period, and leave the duopoly altogether. But imagine how much leverage and how much effect that could have if more people joined along with Rashida Tlaib in solidarity and said, I'm withholding my vote for you, Joe Biden, if you do not call for a ceasefire. Imagine. Now, the left is raising a ruckus here, so to speak, not necessarily politicians or just politicians, but I'm talking about the left in the streets. I'm talking about those of us on the outside. Left revolts over Biden's staunch support of Israel amid Gama, Gaza crisis. Excuse me. And you can see it says ceasefire now. On Wednesday afternoon, hundreds of liberal Jewish American activists staged sit-ins in the Capitol Hill offices of top Democrats, including in the Senate office of progressive champion Bernie Sanders to demand a ceasefire in the escalating war between Israel and Hamas. As they sang in Hebrew and prayed for peace, the U.S., the House floor, resumed legislative activity for the first time in weeks after the election of a new Republican speaker, Congressman Mike Johnson. Doot, doot, doot. Oh, here we go. In his first act, Johnson brought to the floor a resolution declaring U.S. solidarity with Israel after Hamas rampaged through Israeli cities, killing 1,400 people and taking more than 200 hostages. Let's talk here for a second about the death toll, because this is something I've been talking about for quite some time. And that's the fact that, again, when you compare the numbers and we've compared the numbers for over, I think we went all the way back, what, 15 years ago? Every year. There were always more Palestinian death and casualties than there were Israeli death and casualties. So let's always remember that. Nearly all House Democrats voted to approve the measure, save for a resolute minority who dissented, citing its failure to address the thousands of Palestinians killed in Israel's retaliatory bombing campaign of Gaza. The discontent on display in Washington was a testament to the rising anger among the party's left over the response from Biden and Democratic leaders to Israel's war in Gaza. 
But as many progressives split from the White House over the U.S. staunchly pro-Israel stance, there were also splits within the left itself, a sign of the raw emotions stirred by the conflict. To Joe Biden, this is what happens when you don't have a base. You see, Joe Biden never had a base. What Joe Biden had were people who voted for him because they were afraid of Donald Trump being reelected. That's what Joe Biden had. Let's think about people who had a base. Barack Obama, as annoying as he was, and through all his faults, when he ran for president in 08, he had a base. He had a base of people. He had a smaller base in 2012, but he still had a base. Donald Trump has a base. Joe Biden doesn't have a base of people. So when you don't have a base and people just voted for you because they were afraid that the other candidate would be get reelected and they don't want that candidate again, and now you're going into a reelection year, and you have people that Bernie Sanders told to vote for you because, again, you don't want to get Donald Trump again. Now those people that Bernie Sanders funneled in to vote for Joe Biden, those people didn't change their policy positions. The progressives that, you know, held their breath and decided to vote for Joe Biden, those people still want Medicare for all. Those people still have an issue with this conflict in Israel and Palestine. So even though Bernie Sanders was able to move progressive people and get them to support Biden in the end, not all of them, but some of them in the end, they didn't move on the issues. So now some of those people are saying, maybe I don't care if we get Trump again, because this issue is too important. Joe Biden has just been relying on Trump bad. He goes on to say, or he talked about the death toll, he had no confidence. Online, many progressives seethe, accusing Biden of further enabling violence against Palestinians and predicting that he would pay an electoral price next year with Muslim and Arab American voters who have emerged as an important Democratic constituency in recent elections. This is another thing, too. That base right there, Muslim and Arab voters, they may not come out for Joe Biden again. In fact, I've heard from some of them that they plan to not support him in 2024 again. And then I want to get to this piece here. As Israel intensifies its bombardment of Gaza, Biden is facing extraordinary and growing resistance from his party's left flank, especially from young voters and voters of color over his steadfast support for Israel. They have staged demonstrations, penned open letters, and even tendered resignations in protests of the Biden administration's handling of a war they say is threatening the president's stances, standing at home, and possibly his chances of winning re-election next year. And then it gets into the uh, polling and approval rating, which we've discussed uh, recently on here. But this is what happens, like I said before, when you don't have a base. Now, in reference to the split, I told you AOC flip-flops. I think that clip came out earlier today, AOC flip-flop, right? Here she is flip-flopping again. This is the split. Now more than ever, we must emphasize the importance of separating people from governments. Anti-Semitism is disgusting and unacceptable. We have a responsibility to defend our Jewish brothers, sisters, and siblings from hatred. No movement of integrity should tolerate it ever. So you know what's missing from that response? Notice how AOC didn't say the same about the Palestinian people. Notice how she doesn't say that Islamophobia is disgusting and unacceptable. Notice how she doesn't say we have a responsibility to defend 
our Palestinian brothers and sisters? I told you she's a flip flopper. You see, it's easy to come out in support of the state of Israel. That's easy to do. It's not easy to come out and support for the Palestinian people. But AOC made a decision when she wrote this tweet. She decided to only mention one group of people. She decided to only call one group of people our brothers and our sisters. She decided to say that anti-Semitism is disgusting and unacceptable, which I agree. But she won't mention that Islamophobia is disgusting and unacceptable. And another thing I got to say is this. We need to talk about Semitism. Let me go to um, Eric. Can you pull up my, my Twitter page real quick? It should be one of the most recent ones. Because there is something I shared on Twitter today that I think needs to be shared more in reference to anti-Semitism in reference to uh, Semites. And I want you guys, when you are pushed with this, when people are coming to you and they're accusing you of being anti-Semitic because you're going to these protests calling for a ceasefire, here's what I want you to say to people, because we need to break this down. Let's look at the definition of Semite. A person regarded as descended from Shem. Two, a member of any of the people speaking a Semitic language, including the Hebrews, Arabs, Assyrians, and Phoenicians. Let me say this again. A member of any of the people speaking a Semitic language, including the Hebrews, the Arabs, Assyrians, Phoenicians. Why am I showing you this, folks? Palestinians are Semites. And I put this here in the tweet as well. Palestinians are Semites. Stop letting people tell you that pro-Palestinian protests are anti-Semitic. Make sure when people come at you with that jazz, when they hit you with that, make sure you let people know, pull up that definition. Most people probably never even seen that definition until now. Most people don't know. This is what happened was people don't do any research. When people don't check things out on their own and they just listen to what they're told. This is what happens. Now everybody is not in favor of this. When we talk about the divide on the left, we talk about Rashida Tlaib's request to withhold your vote. I've said this before, not everyone in Israel agrees with what is happening to the Palestinian people. And that includes people in Tel Aviv. Now Boots Riley shared this video earlier. These are protests in Tel Aviv. You guys see this? Look at this. Ceasefire. Ceasefire. Are, are these Palestinians? No. These aren't Palestinian people. And this is what mainstream media doesn't want you to see. They don't want you to see this. They didn't want you to see Jewish Voices for Peace protesting in D.C. and New York City. They don't want you to see that. That actually hurts their narrative, right? If you see that there are Jewish people that do not agree with this. But these are the things that we have to let people know. We cannot continue to just sit by and let this go by the wayside. And I'll tell you one thing, not everybody can get out into the streets. Some people physically cannot get out into the streets. Some people can't because of their job, right? Like some people may lose their job if they're caught on camera anywhere, uh, protesting any type of thing, any type of event. But what can you do? You can share those protests. You can let people know about it. But I'm going to tell you this, whether you share these events, whether you attend these events or not, 
Do you want to look back on this day 10, 15, 20 years from now and say, damn, I wish I would have done something? Or do you want to look back on this day and say, I was part of that? I was against it. And I point back to the Vietnam War as well. Vietnam War as well. All the people who were protesting against the Vietnam War, they were right. The people who protested against the Iraq War, they were right. So that's something to keep in mind. Thank you for the super chat, Till Mendom Nation. To Mendom Nation? That's an interesting name. I'm from Germany. If you openly support Palestinians or call out the Israel regime, you'll be canceled. I lost friends over the last couple of weeks for just reposting tweets showing the genocide. Yeah, I, I lived in Germany. I spent like most of my childhood there. It's very sad. Very sad to see uh, Germany. <sighs> Boy, I tell you. It's very sad. Thank you, uh, Chima. In Baltimore, these protests are non-existent. You know why, Chima? Let's talk about this for a second. I believe part of that is due to the fact that most of these things takes place in D.C. And D.C. and Baltimore are close together, right? So my family's from Baltimore. And I think part of the thing is, is like everybody knows all of the energy and mobility is going to be in D.C., not in Baltimore. So it was like, we can mobilize and have this protest in Baltimore, but honestly, I could just hop in the car 30, 45 minutes, depending on traffic, depending on traffic, 30, 45 minutes, and I can be in DC and go to the event that everyone's going to attend. But I know what you mean. Thank you for this uh, as well, Chima. Palestine was called Palestine by Greeks and Romans. Thank you for that. Thank you, David. Someone ought to define anti-Semitism to AOC. I bet you she doesn't know that either, what I just showed you. Natural healer mom. They are brave. Bless them, Lord. Yes, they are brave. Shirley says, I'm a new member of Jewish Voices for Peace. Thank you, Shirley. Awesome. And uh, thank you, Chima. Uh, Amharic, Amrik? Is the oldest Semitic tongue still spoken? Interesting. Chima, you know a lot. You know a lot. We're going to get into this story here about Noam uh, Chomsky. Now, Noam over the past couple of years, you know, Noam being kind of striking out. Like he was striking out when we talked about the mandates. He had a cringe position in reference to that. He said that people should be put on a separate island. Noam was losing it, okay? I was not feeling Noam. Then the information was released that Noam Chomsky apparently was a friend of Jeffrey Epstein. Noam tried to brush it off, pretend like it was no big deal. And I'm like, <laughs> it's a big deal that you were meeting with this guy and hanging out with this dude. Uh, so there was issues there as well. So the past couple of years, Noam has not been on my top list. But someone sent me this video. There's two of them. First, I want to play you one from seven years ago. And this is also in reference to Israel and Palestine. I think it's really important that you hear what he said. Why does the U.S. support Israel? And then I'm going to show you a more recent one. You need to hear this, guys. I wish I heard this back then. Listen to this. Why does the United States support Israel? Well, there's a history and a very interesting one. It actually goes back to uh, goes back a long time. Uh, one thing to remember is that Christian Zionism is a very powerful force, which goes back long before Jewish Zionism. Let me pause there for a second. This is something that Katie Halper mentioned when I interviewed her recently. Zionism is not just for Jewish people, and people have to understand that. Listen to what he just said. There are Christian Zionists. There are Jew and Jewish Zionists. Not everyone that is Jewish is a Zionist. Everyone that I know is Jewish is not a Zionist, by the way. And not everyone that is a Zionist is Jewish. So pay attention to this. In England, particularly, Christian Zionism was a powerful force among British elites. It's part of the motivation for the Balfour Declaration and for powerful force among British elites and which country was the one 
that decided that after the Holocaust, that Jewish people can settle in Palestine. They chose Palestine. I think at one point they looked at Uganda, you know, African countries, uh, and initially settled on Palestine, basically said this land was open and available. Obviously that was not true. There were Palestinians that were already living there, but who made that decision? That was Britain. Let's go on. For Britain's support for Jewish colonization of Israel. Remember, the Bible said, you know, and that's a big part of uh, British elite culture. Same in the United States. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was a, a, a devout Christian who read the Bible every day. So did Harry Truman. Uh, in the Roosevelt administration, one of the leading officials, Harold Ickes, once described the return of the Jews to Palestine as the greatest event in history. It's uh, realizing the lesson of the Bible. Uh, these are deeply religious countries in which the biblical commands, so-called, are taken quite literally. Also, this is just part of colonization. This is the last phase of European colonization. And uh, notice that the countries that are most strongly in support of Israel are not just the United States. It's the United States, Australia, and Canada, the offshoots of England, Anglosphere sometimes called, unusual forms of imperialism. These are settler colonial societies, colon societies in which the, not like India, not like the British in India say, the societies in South Africa was a little like this, or Algeria under the French, settler colonial societies in which the settlers came in essentially eliminated the native population, also driven by uh, religious principles, very religious. Pause there for a second. The United States, Canada, and Australia, settler colonialist societies. Noam Chomsky told you this is the last stage of European colonialism. Last stage. And in reference to the Bible, the religious aspect as well, again, that's if you believe in the Bible. Not everyone believes in the Bible. In the United States, we have something called separation of church and state for a good reason. Could you imagine if we didn't have that in the United States? And let's say the decision was made that Christianity is the religion of the United States. What about everybody else that practices all these other religions, right? But then it goes a step further and it says, well, if you're not Christian, you're, you can only live in, we're just going to put you up in Alaska. Imagine if the U.S. did that. We're just going to put you up in Alaska. But then they go a step further and they say, well, not only if you're not Christian, but if you're not European. This essentially is what you get with Palestine. It's not just about religion. This is about ethnic cleansing. If it was just about religion, they would be totally fine with the Ethiopian Jews that also live there. They would be fine with the Palestinian Jews that live there. Yes, there are Palestinian Jews, but it's not just about that. Religious groups driven by Christian Zionism, those are major cultural factors. There are also significant geostrategic factors. And you go back to 1948, uh, there was actually a split between the State Department and the Pentagon in the United States over how to react to the new state of Israel. The State Department was, 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 question, was not committed strongly to Israeli conquests, the establishment of the state, and was concerned about the refugees. It wanted an implementation of the refugee problem. The Pentagon, on the other hand, was very impressed with Israel's military potential. The Israeli military successes uh, if you look back at the internal record in Declassified, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff described uh, Israel as the second largest military force in the region after Turkey 
and a potential base for U.S. power in the region. That continued, can't run through the whole record, but in 1958, when there was a serious crisis in the region, uh, uh, Israel was the only state that strongly cooperated with Britain and the United States, and it won plenty of support from the governments and the military for that reason. Uh, 1967 is when the current relations with Israel were pretty much established. Israel performed a major service to the United States by destroying a secular Arab nationalism. Um secular. Secular. Now, some people refer to secular as worldly. So he said that Israel supported the United States while ending, let me put this back here. Israel performed a major service to the United States by destroying secular Arab nationalism, secularism, not Christian. Some people call it worldly, right? Those of us that grew up in the church, we know, we know what's up, but what else was happening as well? There was also this move closer towards socialism. There was also this move closer towards getting away from capitalism and criticizing capitalism. JB and I discussed this on the JB and Savvy show on RBN. This is what people have to understand. Why do you think the US government came after Gaddafi? You really believe Gaddafi was out there killing his own people? No, because Gaddafi was moving more towards aspects of socialism because Gaddafi actually wanted Africa to free itself from Western powers and Western imperialism. That's why. This is what this is all about, guys, to keep capitalism in place. And they don't care who they got to kill to make it happen. This is what we have to really understand. This is why I say at the end of the day, it all leads back to money. That's what it's all about. Let's go on. By destroying a secular Arab nationalism, a major enemy of the United States and supporting radical Islam, which the U.S. supported. And it continues right until the present. Uh, right now, we saw an example of that just during the uh, Gaza, uh, latest Gaza attack. You recall that uh, at one point, Israel began to run out of munitions during the assault, despite the fact that it's uh, armed to the teeth. Uh, the United States provided Israel with additional munitions through the Pentagon. Yep. And notice where they were taken from. These were mu U.S. munitions pre-positioned in Israel for eventual use by U.S. forces. One of many signs of how the Israel is regarded as essentially a military offshoot of the United States. Very close intelligence relations that go way back. Many other connections. And uh, the media tend to take up to, to support the policy of the government with very few, you know, kind of little questioning around the edges, but basically accept the policy. So for example, take another issue. Uh, take the US invasion of Iraq. You cannot find the phrase US invasion of Iraq in the US media, though it was obviously an invasion, uh, a blatant act of aggression, a textbook case of uh, well, that's Nuremberg trials called the supreme international crime cannot be mentioned. Uh, President Obama is praised as an opponent of the invasion. And yep. What did he say? He said it's a mistake. It's a strategic blunder. We're not going to get away with it. Now, that's about as that's the kind of opposition that uh, you heard from uh, the German general staff during Hitler's invasion of Russia. It's a blunder shouldn't do it, we should knock off England first. Now, that's regarded as opposition. The same in Vietnam, it's now, there's now a commemoration underway, big commemoration of US sacrifices in Vietnam. Try to find the phrase US invasion of South Vietnam there or anywhere in the past year since 1961 when it took place non-existent maybe on democracy now and that is on purpose 
They are very careful to make it. And the media apparatus supports the State Department talking points. And this is why it's difficult to find these things that Noam is referring to. That's why it's difficult to find U.S. invasion of Iraq or U.S. invasion of Vietnam. It's always usually phrased in a way that makes the U.S. look like the good guys. That's on purpose. The State Department creates the narrative, the media apparatus, mostly mainstream media, mainstream media apparatus supports and defends the State Department narrative. This is exactly why people like Karine Jean-Pierre are saying things like comparing the pro-Palestinian protests to the people that were marching in Charlottesville, Virginia. This is why. Now she knows that shit sound crazy. She knows she had to go at home and think twice about that. Look at that. Like, man, I can't believe they had me say this, but I got to do this if I want to keep this job and I want to stay in these high profile places where I've been. And the thing is, is that's how it works. That's exactly how it works. So they're all in on it, guys. The media, the State Department, the military industrial complex, the politicians, they're all in on it. It's one big club. I, what I write, but way out at the fringe. And this is not unique to the United States. Take, say, Britain. Right now, there's interesting debates in the British literary journals, like the Times Literary Supplement, as to whether Britain should finally begin to recognize the genocidal, the word that's used, genocidal character of British colonization hundreds of years ago. Should Israel, should Britain begin to face it? You know, you can ask that question in many places. Uh, the tendency of the uh, intellectual community to go along like a herd in support of state power, yep. private power is just overwhelming. Uh, we t intellectuals like to think of themselves as dissident, critical, courageous, standing up against power. Absolutely untrue. You look at the historical record, that's a small fringe, and they're usually punished. The mainstream tends to be uh, what was once called a herd of independent minds marching in support of state power. Nothing new here. Unfortunate, you have to fight against it. Not new. Why does the United States? Let me say something about that. What he said there at the end in reference to the academics fighting back against the State Department, et cetera. Notice he said the majority of them, that's actually not the case. There's a, a small fringe, <laughs> there they go with that word fringe again, a group that does that. And they're usually destroyed professionally. Look at someone like Norm Finkelstein. So he's one of those people that has been willing to do that, to put your career on the line, right? Like Norm Finkelstein, last time I read, he cannot go back to Israel from what I understand. Like when we talk about people being canceled, that's why I told you Dave Chappelle ain't been canceled, you know, but when we talk about people that have kind of had a lot of things that were stripped away from them. You know, Norm Finkelstein was a professor at one point that was taken away from him. He lost the right to return to Israel, if I remember correctly. Those are the, the fringe, the small group of people that Noam was referring to. And like he said, the State Department will destroy those people. They will destroy their careers. So he's telling you a lot of these academics that think they're speaking out against these things don't really do so. But what you have to understand is that there's a lot to this. There's a whole thing to it. Now, there's another one that I want you to hear as well. This one was posted recently, also from Gnome. Um, let me get this ready here. Because I really want you guys to understand how this all works. And this one says, why is America or why America holds Israel as a sacred cow? Listen to this. Important factors. I mean, let's start with what's called conservative support from Israel. At first, I think some kind of somatic hygiene is useful. Uh, there's really no conservatives in the United States. The people who are called conservatives are 
radical statists for the most part. Uh, that's very different from. Uh, uh, I'll put the captions up here since this is audio. He said, there's no conservatives in the United States. They're radical status. And there are a few genuine conservatives, which means something like classical liberals, but not many. Uh, the, what are called the, cons if you take a look at what's at the Republican Party today, which is the strongest, you know, extreme support for Israeli policies, they have a popular base. Uh, a large part of the popular base is Christian evangelicals. They are passionate supporters of Isra Israeli policies, and they are also extreme anti-Semites. If you take a look at their, <laughs> you take a look at the, they don't say it, but take a look at the doctrines, like the dispensationalist doctrines. Yeah, yeah. They're looking forward to a battle in Armageddon, you know, where everybody gets murdered and the saved souls rise to heaven. Now, what happens to the Jews? Well, you know, according to some of these versions, 160,000 of them find Christ in time and they're saved. The rest are condemned to eternal damnation. How can you be more anti-Semitic than that? You know, and in fact, they're, you know, they're, uh, but their support for Israel is because partly, you know, interpretation of the Bible, interpretation of the Book of Revelations, and so on and so forth, which leads them to strongly support Israeli crimes, to the extent that, I mean, Israel welcomes the support, but it also tries to control them, like when they. They try to blow up the Temple Mount and so on. Israel doesn't think that's a good idea, so they block them. Let me pause here for just a second. I want to say something again about in reference to the Bible. For those of us that grew up in the church, like we know there are multiple interpretations of the Bible. There are different Bibles. There are different, you know, and that's another thing too. Like there's the King James version of the Bible. Like, uh, I remember when um, the Mormons came around and uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to say it that way, but this is what happened when the Mormons came around and like when they were, you know, knocking on my door and stuff and just like, can we talk to you about, you know, we're from the church of Latter-day Saints. And I remember, you know, I really like people knocking on the door and it, it was like, it's nothing against you guys. It's nothing against people who are Mormon. It's nothing against people who are Jehovah's Witnesses. But, you know, the, the knock on the door and can I come into your house. I don't know you, you know, sit like in your living room and talk to you about, bruh, I don't know you. Like that was the thing. Like, I don't know you. And it's, I remember one time I tried to be nice about it and dudes didn't get the hint. And then they came back the next day, the very next day and knocked on my door and said, well, we just wanted to come by again since you were busy yesterday. And I'm like, look, I don't know you. I lived by myself at that time, you guys. This was right after I graduated undergrad. I was living by myself. And like, I'm supposed to let these just strange dudes just come in and sit down and just be like, hey, let me sit down and talk to you. Da, da, da. And then let me tell you, then when you say, no, you're not interested, then they try to make you feel like a bad person because you're not interested. I don't have time and I don't know you. But anyway, there are multiple versions of the Bible. So according to which denomination, which Christian denomination you talk to, you may get a different response about who's supposed to be protected and who's not supposed to be protected. And that's another thing. So that's something to think about. But why is the Republican Party, why does it have a popular base like that? That's part of its popular base. Another part of its popular base is uh, people who are so terrified uh, that they have to have a gun in their pocket when they go into Starbucks to get a cup of coffee. That's, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's something that goes way back in American history. This has always been a very frightened country and for pretty understandable reasons. From the very beginning, there were real threats from the people we were suppressing. Uh, the Indians could fight back. Uh, black slaves might revolt uh, after the Haitian Revolution. There's a huge fear. So everybody has to have a gun. We have to protect ourselves. Uh, and it goes on and on. 
well, that's a large part of the base of the Republican Party. Uh, another part is the nativist element. If you look at the demography of the United States, uh, the white population is, will soon become a minority. Uh, the phrase that's used is, they are taking our country away from us. Yeah. Uh, they being all of those bad people. And that's a big part. You know, it's, a, it's an element in American society. These sectors have been mobilized by the Republicans roughly in the past 20 years for a very good reason. The Republican Party since about 1995 has stopped being a parliamentary party. It's off the spectrum. They are so dedicated to service to the extreme, to extreme wealth and corporate power that they cannot get votes by putting forth their own programs. Now, think about what he said there, right? But this part here about not getting votes and the corporate powers, that also applies to the Democratic Party today. That also applies to the Democratic Party today. Now, I want to scoot forward just a little bit here. Do, 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 do. And then um, I can make sure to add this as well. When he gets to Egypt, I can add this link as well. Once again, you're going to hear him mention this word secular. Listen to this. Radical Islam in Saudi Arabia and secular nationalism, which meant Egypt. The United States pretty consistently supports radical Islam, just as the British did in their in the day when they ran the place. Secular nationalism is considered a threat. It might move towards independence. And that is intolerable if you're trying to run the world. Uh, running. If you're trying to run the world, say it again for the people in the back. Do you hear that? Secularism moves to independence. And that is a threat in the world. That's a threat to countries like the United States because the United States is trying to run the world. They don't want these countries to have full independence. Mm hmm. So he says, if you're trying to if you're trying to run the world, the world is uh, I mean, for, you know, for good for good reasons, you could go into it, but it is intolerable. And radical Islam has been more under control. Well, in 1967, uh, Israel administered a lethal blow to secular nationalism. They smashed uh, Egypt, which was the center of it. Big gift to Saudi Arabia. In fact, yep. there was a war going on at the time between Saudi Arabia and uh, Egypt, a kind of a proxy war in the Yemen. And uh, Israel settled it in favor of Saudi Arabia, the main U.S. ally, the extremist, most extreme Islamic, Amer uh, Islamic radical state. Uh, but it's where all the oil is. So that's been the U.S. ally since, uh, you know, 1940s. That's where all the oil is. See that? Uh, and uh, th uh, this was a major gift to the United States and its ally. You take a look, that's when American aid to Israel shot up. In uh, 1970, um, you may recall, there was a, uh, the, the government of Jordan was, uh, initiated a military campaign against the Palestinians in Jordan, a real massacre. It looked for a while as if Syria might move to protect the Palestinians. The US didn't want that. The US was completely embroiled at that time in Southeast Asia, couldn't do a thing. It asked Israel to mobilize its forces to compel Syria to withdraw. Hold on to that part right there. This is where the Syria piece comes in. So the US was afraid that Syria was actually going to try to help the Palestinian people. And the US said, oh no, we can't have that. Fast forward to where we are today in the situation in Syria, how the U.S. is occupying a third of Syria, which just happens to be where the oil is located, how Israel was bombing. So what did I tell you past couple of days? Israel was, isn't just bombing Gaza. They're also bombing Lebanon and Syria as well. They did. 
and the US aid to Israel quadrupled that year. And so it continues. There's a very close strategic alliance. Uh, it, it extends to uh, 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 military and intelligence relations, which are very close. So it takes a drone technology. Now, a lot of it's developed in uh, Rafael Industries uh, near Haifa. Uh, Rafa, the main, main Israeli, the Israeli economy by now relies very heavily on uh, uh, high-tech military production and export in close relationship to the United States. High-tech military production and export and close relationship to the United States. This is why the U.S. is not going to try to uh, defund the military industrial complex in this country. This is why they don't want to actually decrease that defense budget. Listen to what he just told you that the state of Israel depends on military tech, tech military production and export in a close relationship to the United States. Now I'm not gonna play the entire video, but I will put the link, Eric, can we put the link to that video in the chat too so people can watch that one as well? That's called Noam Chomsky, Why America Holds Israel as a Sacred Cow. Go watch the whole thing. That's not the whole thing, but I wanted you to hear both of those videos uh, together. Now there's more because I want you to take in everything that he just told you. And I want you to listen to this crazy response from Hillary Clinton pushing back against a ceasefire. Listen to this. People who are calling for a ceasefire now do not understand Hamas. That is not possible. It would be such a gift to Hamas because they would spend whatever time there was a ceasefire in effect rebuilding their uh, armaments, you know, creating stronger positions to be able to fend off uh, an eventual um, assault by the Israelis. So we're in a very different world. I don't think it had to be the world we're in, but that's where we are and we've got to figure our way uh, forward through it. Did you notice there was some stumbling from her there towards the end after she said why we can't call for a ceasefire? Guys, what I'm trying to tell you is this. This has nothing to do with protecting the Israeli people. This is all about the relationship that the U.S. has with Israel in reference to the military industrial complex, in reference to intelligence. That's, just, that's what this is about. And in reference to what did I tell you the other day about the resources along the Gaza Strip, oil and gas. That's what this is all about. And there have been leaked documents recently. I want to share this because this came out, this news came to me last night. And I want you to hear about this for the people who say this is just about Israel's right to exist. Honey, information has been leaked. Leaked documents, Israeli intelligence, think tank layout plans for ethnically cleansing Gaza. This is what I was trying to warn people about. See, this wasn't supposed to get out, but it's everywhere now. Everywhere. There appears to be a real push from within the Israeli regime to ethnically cleanse the people of Gaza into the Sinai Desert of Egypt. Now, why is that important? Where did they tell the Palestinians to go to? They said, leave the north of Gaza, go towards the south of Gaza. Then we hear reports from the southern part of Gaza where people are saying that their people are being attacked there too, right? That they're bombing people there in the southern part as well. This is in an effort to push them into Egypt and then deny them the right to return. And I want people to fully grasp this, to fully get what I'm saying here. The whole thing, the whole plan was to push them out. Let's go on. On the first day of Israel's war on the Gaza Strip, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu offered a provocative warning to some 2.3 million civilians in the besieged coastal enclave. Leave now, he said, knowing that the people were trapped and could not. However, as time goes on and documents are leaked, there appears to be a real push from within the Israeli regime to ethnically cleanse the people of Gaza into the Sinai Desert of Egypt. 
The Israeli think tank, the Miskov Institute for National Security and Zionist Strategy, published a position paper on October 17th in which they outlined the proposed ethnic cleansing plan, declaring that there is at the moment a unique and rare opportunity to evacuate the whole Gaza Strip in coordination with the Egyptian government. This was then followed shortly after by a report released on Israeli news outlet uh, Calculus, which outlined a document proposing the same strategy. In this case, however, the document bore the official symbol of the Israeli intelligence ministry headed by Agila Gamaliel. Both plans, which advocate the same plot to ethnically cleanse Gaza of its Palestinian civilian population, blatantly seek to take advantage of the situation at hand in order to create a solution to Israel's Gaza problem. The idea is to provide Egypt with an economic incentive, even if that has to be 20 to $30 billion, according to the think tank paper, in order to have them submit to accepting the displaced Palestinian people. There is also a fitted in element, which is highlighted in the Israeli intelligence ministry plan, which talks about setting up a security slash buffer zone inside Egyptian territory, several kilometers wide, effectively proposing a de facto occupation of Egypt's land for the sole purpose of preventing Gaza's people returning to their homes. I'm going to say this again. The sole purpose of preventing Gaza's people from returning to their homes. This is what I've been telling you. Get them out. Take the land. Take the resources along the Gaza coast. Eric, we can share that in the chat too. Because there's a link to the actual link document too. So if you want to, we can share that also in the chat. So I don't know. I honestly don't even know what else to say, you guys. All I can just tell you is that these are very scary times. You have to get the truth out there to people. And people really need to know what this is about. Kim Iverson also shared this as well on Twitter, but I'll put this here so you guys have it too. Because, uh, yeah, but she shared it too on Twitter. So just FYI, you can see what's out here. Someone said something about Yemen. Uh, That happened right before I went live. I can um, share that as well because I heard that was, um, I heard that was lit right now. Here it is. Here it is. Yep. Okay, we'll share this. Yemen has declared official war with Israel. You see, this is going to get messy, guys. This is going to get messy. Why can't I, honey, why you don't have... Why is this one doing this? Did she not? Oh, hold on. Let me make sure I got the video. Back. Let's see if they kept it here. Um, Is this the video or is this? Okay, here's the video. Okay, here we go. Ironically, a nation which has also been forgotten by the world and itself is going through a humanitarian humanitarian crisis is the only one to step up to the Israeli genocide being committed. That's Yemen. Here's the announcement here. Here we go. <laughs> 
والإنسانية والوطنية واستجابة لمطالب شعبنا اليمني العزيز ومطالب الشعوب الحرة ونجدة لأهلنا المظلومين في غزة كان لا بد للقوات المسلحة اليمنية أن تقوم بواجبها بالتوكل على الله وانتصارا للمظلومية التاريخية للشعب الفلسطيني العزيز وعليه وب... Therefore, with allies' help, our armed forces have launched a large batch of ballistic and wing missiles. أول الله تعالى قامت قواتنا المسلحة بإطلاق دفعة كبيرة من الصواريخ البالستية والمجنحة وعدد كبير من الطائرات الم... and a large number of drones on different targets in Israel. مسيرة على أهداف مختلفة للعدو الإسلامي الدينية. I know he was talking fast, huh? Okay, but he said from a sense of religious, ethical, humanitarian, and natural responsibility. So I muted him this time so I can just talk about, I forgot this part. And in response to the demands of our dear Yemeni uh, nation and of all other free nations, and in order to rescue people oppressed in Gaza, it is mandatory that our Yemeni forces to fulfill its duty. And then he gets into uh, what they're planning to do there. So guys, this is huge. This is huge because Yemen knows, Yemen knows, right? They've been constantly attacked by Saudi Arabia. You know, there was this push at one point to end the attacks um, from Saudi Arabia and Israel, but that legislation was never brought to the floor because Bernie Sanders cucked out because Joe Biden told him not to do it. Honey, so now that they've joined in, this makes me wonder if other countries will join in as well. But it's getting hot in these streets. See, this is why it was important to have a ceasefire. Let me go to some of the comments here. Um, sensory pictures. Sabi, can a Muslim or a Buddhist be elected president? I do not know. Technically, you're elected based on votes, right? Right. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. Um, oh, yeah. Cheerio. We did post the video. All right. Capitalism equals greed, materialism, wars, oppression, slavery, colonialism, imperialism and income inequality. Well said. Team Orca says last time Mormon kids came to my door, I talked to them about socialism. Never had another knock. I bet. Uh, thank you for the super chat, Janine. Yemen has declared war with Israel until a ceasefire. Thank you, Janine. Yeah, I saw this come up through the chat and I was like, oh yeah, I saw something earlier, um, but I didn't get a chance to see the whole thing. Thank you for the super sticker, um, Evan, Ayavin? Ayavin B, thank you. And thank you for the super sticker, DJ Adam. Great voices highlighted, thanks. Thank you. Again, speaking of DJs, where is DJ Khaled on this issue? For those who don't know, DJ Khaled is Palestinian. Have I haven't heard DJ Khaled say anything? We the best. No? We not the best? No? DJ Khaled, we the best. We're taking over. All right. Well, I guess not. And thank you for this, uh, Eric. I'll share this is what Jean was mentioning uh, about that protest that she mentioned in the chat. Find a protest, stop the Gaza genocide, how to rise up with Palestine. Oh yes, let's put this in the uh, put this in the chat, Eric, so people can find um, find protests because it even shows them here. Join a protest, different days that they're happening. Oh, this is legit. This is okay. This is based. This is pretty based. And I told you guys, November 4th is the big day that they're going to be a lot of them, right? Even Burlington, Vermont. Yep. Mm -hmm. And there's Denver, Colorado. That's Sunday in Rockville, Maryland. Yeah. So check that out, guys. Should be fun stuff. All right. I'll take the comment on Rockfin and then I'm going to head out. Continue on Halloween festivities. Uh, thank you for the uh, tip on Rockfin JBB. Thank you so much, Sabby, for the rational and humane commentary. Thank you so much. 
All right, guys, that is it for me tonight. Please enjoy the rest of your Halloween. Thank you for the super chat, Marvin. Uh, look up Oded Yenin plan about greater Israel expansion. I believe we, I showed that uh, a couple nights ago on the channel. I believe I did. And Saker says, uh, Sabi, please get the Palestinian activist professor and comedian Amir Zar on. I can look him up as well. Thank you. All right, guys, again, please enjoy the rest of your Halloween. Have fun out there, but be safe out there. Okay. All right. Have a good night. Keep up the fight. Thank you.